Probably can't even see me here because I'm wearing camo. All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and today we are without Ian once again. His father is still uh, out and not feeling great, so best of luck to uh, Pops and Ian uh, getting better. But today we are joined by some special guests. We have a little bit of a look with the lighting, just because we have more people in the uh, in the studio today than normal. So uh, welcome. We have BJ Leach and Caitlin Leach and Trevor Beatty. Beatty. Yep. And I got that somewhat right for once. Um, and uh, you guys are from Addiction Power Sports uh, Northwest. So you guys are out of uh, Woodland, Washington. Yep. And that, that's just north of Portland, Oregon, right? Just right. Yeah, about 20 miles. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we first met um, online, I think. Uh, and then uh, at some of the uh, takeover events over in Oregon, I think, is when we first saw each other face to face. But yeah, you guys have been up to some pretty dirty work this weekend. Where, where have you been? Northern Idaho, we were up at the Insanity Fab Winter Challenge, uh, our first time going up there. We were going to race King of the Hammers, but we bailed out just because of the whole COVID-19 stuff. We didn't want to get all of our stuff down there and spend the money it takes to get signed up and get entered and get your crew down there and uh, and then have them pull the plug or something happen, you know. Right. So it was a little bit of a high-risk race for us, so we, we pulled out of that one. We went up and checked this one out, and we're glad we did. We had a really good time, and it was a fun race. So, um, Insanity Fab's uh, Winter Challenge, that is um, an off-road, is it, a, is it a timed race or a lap race? Five laps. Um, they start everybody out all at once, and you just okay. take off, and it's a full it's a head-to-head shot. battle. Yep. And so, in northern Idaho, this time of year, it's uh, ice, snow, mud, yep. lots of rocks, lots yep. of pits, oh, lots yeah. of ruts. And I think it started off as a kind of like an off-road truck Jeep challenge, right? Yep. Um, I think it was maybe two years ago they started bringing UTVs in. So this is our first time just getting involved. I'm not sure exactly when they brought the UTVs in, but uh, it's the it, I, I know it's recently. Yeah, and uh, so you guys went up this uh, this weekend and raced. Um, it starts on a Thursday, Thursday or Friday. Yep, Thursday yeah. morning. And uh, they have different classes, I think. Right, they have about four classes. Yep. And uh, so the course itself is um, kind of just like in the middle of the woods some guy's property right yeah um and uh lots of uh obstacles to get around how long's the the lap on that is it about a mile uh it was a few miles i think they were saying it was about 35 mile race overall with everything so you go into you come out this field take off start go down and back get into the trees wind all over through the woods shoot you out onto a huge uh really nicely built short course track you hit the whole short course track and it stuffs you back in the woods. You wiggle that out and then you come back out and you start your lap again back into the field and, and just keep on going. But they they were estimating about a 35-mile race. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. Um, and it's funny when it, when it first starts, everything's white. And yeah. by the weekend, it's over. It doesn't look like there's any snow on the ground anywhere. It's all brown. No. But uh, so you were racing your uh, turbo, right? Your yep. Razor Turbo. Yep. And uh, you took two cars or one car? Uh, just one to race. The other one we just brought with us, uh, Chase Truck, you know, to be able to run parts to the pits and things of that nature. Gotcha. Who was uh, so, who was driving? Uh, BJ, you were driving? Yeah, I drove. Caitlin co-piloted for her first time over there. It was a good time. She was great. <laughs> is, there a, is there a map or something that you're supposed to follow or more of just having more eyes on the course while you're out there? Uh, in terms of having her as a co-pilot? Yeah. Yeah, mainly to help me find the bypasses because there's a lot of places where you have to pull off course to hit these huge bypasses because the rock buggies and the big tire class um, tear up a few spots that just get too deep for a side-by-side you'll just get swallowed up in there so they right. bypass it for the side-by-sides and so when you're coming in hot it's easy to miss your bypass <laughs> well but, and if i've known anything from the time i've spent with you is is bringing your foot off the gas requires someone to tell you to do so <laughs> <laughs> and that happened yeah that happened a lot I, every time i'd pass trevor he was slow it down <laughs> and same with caitlin she kept slowing me down and it's yeah, easy to lost, get excited. We lost comms uh, halfway through our very first lap. So oh, we man. had absolutely no communication with the outside and no communication between the two of us. And so it was just <laughs> a lot of hand signals. A lot yeah. of whack in the helmet. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out pretty good, though. I'm sure Trevor was just watching him. Like ball joints, hubs, axles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talk a lot during the races. I'm nonstop just. Every parameter of the car, he's going through checking it or trying while he's racing, and so trying to feel it out. Yeah, so we know exactly what we're expecting coming into the pits. We know we're out with fuel. That's something he ain't got to think about. He just has to answer my questions and 
when you lose that, you're lost. It sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely confusing. You don't know how far the guy is behind you, if you've still got to stay with the throttle or if you can cruise and take care of the car and get it out through the five laps. And it was a tough race, a lot of carnage. Um, how many UTVs were in <clears throat> your guys' class? Ten, I believe. Was there ten? Ten or eleven, yeah. It was a pretty good It was a pretty good uh, start gate. So I know that the, the guys that go up there, they kind of have this like two, three-week rush to get their cars rebuilt from the, the full year's torture before they go and torture it again. Yep. Um, what were some of the kind of commonalities you were seeing between cars? I mean, obviously, we're talking big tires, as much clearance as you can probably get. It's lots of, lots of like you were saying, deep ruts, big rocks. Um, what were some of the commonalities in the car builds? Um, well, mud tires for sure. Uh, I guess one year somebody ran paddle tires and did really well all the way around. But, <laughs> uh, you know, mud tires... Just good, strong parts, you know, honestly. the There was a lot of carnage of just stock A-arms, stock trailing rod, uh, tra sorry, radius rods. Um, there was people that bent trailing arms. A lot of the stock parts were getting bent and beat up, but, uh, yeah. you know. If I you can't imagine good... someone doing stock out there. That would be, pretty, I mean, unless they just don't know what they're getting into. There's quite a few. Yeah. Like, I'd say the majority is running on stock parts, and they do really well. Hmm. Yeah. I, I would imagine if I was going out to there, I'd be like, well, this is my reason to upgrade. So I might as well trash the parts while yeah, I have them. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. So what did, what was your experience being co-pilot in something like that? I mean, that's a pretty dirty race and pretty aggressive bouncing around and all that. But I'm sure you're used to a little bit of that with <laughs> riding with BJ and normally. Yeah. Well, our first heat was kind of funny or it got off to kind of a rough start because um, we started, did like a warm up kind of heat on the car. And then uh, all of a sudden it got thrown into limp mode, like when they were getting ready to raise the flag. So we were kind of messing with it a little bit and then they just ended up having to start the race anyway. Obviously, you know, they can't wait. Right. So we drove into the pit while everyone else drove off and it turned out our fans weren't kicking on. So uh -huh. we took off on our race with a leaf blower <laughs> pointed towards the radiator. Our blower pointed back. We unplugged our air hoses and pointed that back and just were like, we're going to try to get our laps in and hopefully someone breaks out and we can work on the car and get to the next heat. And we had to stop once and pack the radiator with snow and continue on. And by the time we finished our first lap, fans kicked on and we were back in business. So that was <laughs> it was kind of a rocky start, but kind of a funny story too. So the it's stressful. So the fans just froze up, or no? We we something we just realized. Uh, you know, it's not. It's pretty cold up there, right? And so the fans are they're perfect for like desert. You know, where they kick on, they stay on for a while once the car gets hot and warm. Um, but up there, it was as soon as they'd kick on, they'd just get up to full speed and then they'd shut right back down. And so with that, it was coming. They were kicking off and on a bunch, and overheated our relay. So, I was gonna say the relay come take out. Yeah. So we the. The relay just shut off until it, it cooled down, and then it gave us our fans back. So, it was, <laughs> so learn something new every day, you know. So we're gonna go to bigger relay, and um, we talked to CBR. That's the radiator setup and fan setup we have in there, and they said just run your bypass switch right out of the gate the whole time you're there. Yeah. Um, until you get that relay upgraded to a bigger, better relay, but. On the flip side, that kind of hurt us too because it killed our battery. So running oh. the fans <laughs> the whole entire race. Yeah. Killed the battery. Yeah. And, and, and does that car have a upgraded stator or is that a, a stock stator? Stock stator, full throttle battery. Um, that's Without that, we wouldn't have got through the race with those fans the whole race. But uh, yeah, it was a good time, man. Everything worked out good. Towards the end, uh, we put up on the final race, you know, we put a decent size gap on second place and, and the rest of them. And that's where everybody started trying to slow me down because we had a good size gap. And fortunately, we did because about 50 yards from the finish line, um, it was an easy section. I took advantage, or I, I guess I just, uh, that's the word I'm looking for. I Took it for granted. Yeah, I took the easy spot for granted, and it bit me. I flopped the car on its side. It was a spot oh, that we... Oh, is that what happened? Because I saw you yeah. were out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we flopped in a, in a big mud pit right before the finish line. Like, we could see the checkered flag around the corner, right. and we are trying frantically to get the car up and on its wheels. <laughs> the battery was too dead for the winch to work, to winch it over. Oh, so we're man. trying to lift it. We're trying everything we could. She ran over to the pits. Um, 
came back. We ended up getting a jump box, hooked it to the battery, was able to start the car, get the winch in and out, flipped the car back over, took off, made it through the finish line. About five seconds later, here came second place. Well, I saw somebody posted a cell phone <clears throat> video of you guys do it, of you getting out of the out of the way. Where did it flip over on your side or BJ's side? On um, BJ's side. side, but I but had you to were climb, covered. <laughs> I had to climb out through his window, and as soon as I got out, it was like we were in a big mud hole. Yeah. So. I had to kind of wade through that and then run to the pits, get our jump box, come back. We ended up getting the winch line. Well, the winch line got stuck <laughs> through with the hook right. through uh, the front of the car. Fair lead. Yeah, and I couldn't get it out of there. And so ended up cutting the winch line and just running it up and over and tying <laughs> it around the tree. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, before you can take off again, you got to have your helmet on, seatbelt on, wind right. nuts up, right. winch line cinched all the way in, so you ain't got no loose cable hanging behind you. Uh, Did you happen to have the rapid recovery winch, or was it a slow weight? Yeah, it's a slow weight. <laughs> it was a worn uh, 4,500, a good winch, but uh, definitely not a fast one. We'll be right. upgrading that. But <laughs> what saved us was, as soon as I said, as soon as we get this car over, you cut that rope right at the winch because it was the oh, uh, synthetic rope yeah. line. So as soon as we flopped over, she took the knife, sliced the rope so we didn't have to winch that in. And um, then I started fighting get my window nets up. Oh, <laughs> When we flopped it on my side, it bent one of the tabs. Yeah, And so I couldn't get it up. My hands were just swamped with mud. I'm trying to get it in there. I couldn't get it. I'm screaming help. Finally, she sees I'm struggling. She comes running around, helps me just barely get it in there just enough to stay and jumps. Out. And he's like, go. <laughs> I take off. And uh, it was just, man, it was just by the hair on our chin that we yeah. finaled out in first place. It yeah, because you went around that last luck. corner and the guy was right right where you were. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was literally right behind us. I don't know how. It seemed like we were there for 30 minutes. I don't know how that's possible, but he told me it was only nine. It felt yeah, we like. It took us nine minutes <laughs> to get the car like back. When you're racing, it seems like an eternity. Yeah. And, and that time. can be, you know, when it comes to racing, that guy it could be five seconds or 20 minutes. You don't know. Yeah. And there was a guy uh, right on us with his Articat, and uh, he broke his A-arms a couple corners right before I flopped. So uh, had he not broke, he would have got first place. So it was just wow. kind of like, you know, you never know what's going to happen, and you could be so close to the finish line and just lose the whole race on a simple error, you know, and that's kind of – it taught me a lot. You know, I don't ever take anything for granted. It doesn't right. matter how big a lead you have. Easy spots can still bite you. Well, we were just, uh, I was watching the the coverage of the Dakar race, you know, and Chris and Matlock's out there with, yeah. with Team USA for Polaris Razor. And, um, you know, I think we've all heard stories about Dunes biting back and it definitely did the same thing for her. She took a, took a lip for granted and it was a witch eye and took her whole front end out. So yeah. um, when it comes to racing, like you said, can't take anything for granted and you have to expect every corner to have something new to fight back at you. Yeah, Absolutely. But uh, so tell us a little bit about the car. I mean, that car, like uh, what year is it? 18 or 19? 2019 19. Turbo S Velocity. Gotcha. So it has the Velocity shock still on it? Yep. We had them revalved and resprung with uh, Zebros. Great kit. Works awesome. Um, car handles amazing. HCR suspension works killer. We, can, we don't worry about the suspension at all. It's good, solid suspension. Um, you know, when you got good parts on the car, you can really rest at ease about worried about the car bending an a-arm or a trailing arm and you can really focus on your driving and your racing and uh it helps a lot so hcr parts were awesome we got the rhino 2.0 axles in there that held up really good um we had some sweet tires on there that were really giving us a lot of traction some nice big tires that make some clearance yeah um what kind of ball joints um what were those keller. Th- yep keller yeah keller? Yep. those are the ticket they're freaking massive yeah yeah i mean i guess a lot of you that are watching this probably seen uh, Ruslan huck it at UTV Takeover, wadded the car up hard, and didn't hurt a darn thing on the car. I mean, it was just tore a shock out of the um, upper frame mount, which was a simple fix. Gusset so, kit. So that car was jumped uh, in Virginia Yep. at Virginia Takeover, and that's where it, Virginia or Winoka? Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, Winoka. Winoka. Yep. And, and he rolled it, um, and uh, like you said, didn't really do much outside of that shock uh, mount. And then he that came back to to Washington and was rebuilt, or fixed, I should say, and then hucked at uh, Coos Bay takeover, yep. um, and he think he went 131 feet, something like that. Yeah, he hucked pretty far. Yeah, and no problems there. And then nope. um, then that car was shipped up to Utah, wasn't it? Yep. And uh, they did something to it, I think, up there. Yeah, when it got up there, I, they started having issues with our power steering. Oh, okay. um, it's an e power kit, so the a little bit stronger power steering for 
jarring and slamming. It doesn't kick your e-power out as easy. Okay. And so the upgraded kit that we had in there, it's got a variable adjustment knob, and that failed. And so they ended up having to, we overnighted one out to them. They got that swapped in there, got the steering back. I think they also had an issue with something in the um, in the gearbox of that e-power motor, but they got it up and rolling for him, and he went out there and hucked it and got first place. So yeah. we, were, we were happy. And he that. went a little bit further than Oregon, too. So, yeah. Um, so that e-power, is that a full rack and pinion replacement, or is that just the uh, the rack? Just the motor, right? Yeah, it's just the box, and then the brain, bigger power leads. So. Okay. So it, it draws more power, too, then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it's electric, not hydraulic. Uh, and then does it have a, does it have a steering uh, booster on it, like a, like a Hess? Or anything on it? Yeah, it had the Hess 2 to 1. We pulled that out for this race because it was going to be a real hard, jarring, deep course with big tires, you know? So we pulled that out. But it's good for short course racing. you got to have quicker steering if you want to be competitive. It, it's such a, a game changer. You just go from, uh, you know, 90 degrees to the left, you're full lock left. 90 degrees to the right, you're full lock right. And you never take your hands off the wheel for a switch back corner or anything. And super helpful. So, um so do you guys have any kind of a uh, flash tune or any kind of uh, fuel mapping on that car? Yeah. Or some custom <laughs> secret stuff, secret sauce. No, it's our, <laughs> over, it's our over the counter kit. Um, we have some more extensive tuning done to it than just the standard plug and play, but um, it's our addiction turbo kit. It's a water cooled turbo, bigger injectors, pump, uh, it's running on the 85. <clears throat> um, it's super smooth. It makes good power. Nothing crazy. It spools faster than stock, but just smooth, smooth power. So this is an actual like turbo upgrade kit that you in-house at Addiction Power Sports provide, can install and provide to a consumer? Absolutely. Yep. And uh, we use Andy Malone, Power Tune. We couldn't do this without him, man. He's a great guy. He's uh, always down to help us. Even his just over-the-counter flash tunes that we can provide our customers with are amazing. Or if they want to do custom tuning, we can do that as well. But yeah, Power Tune has uh, been a huge part of our success in getting the power to the ground for sure. So a lot of people know about, you know, Evo, Stage 3, Stage 5, whatever, um, some of the other guys out there that are, re are really popular right now. Uh, but it's important that people know that they have options, right? And they have people they can work with uh, in the local communities that can do as good or better or even more just personalized work on their car. Yep. Um, you don't have to just do an online order and, and have the same thing everybody else has, right? Yep. So what are some of the benefits of that turbo kit? Like you were saying, it spools fast. It does all that. Is it is it a much bigger turbo? Is it like a big That's, turbo kit, or is it just a turbo replacement? Yeah, it is a big turbo kit. It is a little bit bigger turbo. It's really efficient, but being water cooled as well just helps a little bit on the reliability side of it. Um, so then you have a second cooler for that? No. Or you tie it into the stock? Just in the stock. We separated our uh, heat exchanger and radiator into two different systems instead of running it all together. And so we have that big CBR radiator and heat exchanger out back. So. Uh, cooling's not an issue there as long as our fans work. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so you guys, uh, as a shop, also uh, support a number of different athletes around the Northwest. And I don't know if you guys go outside the Northwest, but I know like um, little Wyatt, I know he's been a big um, a fan, fan of what you guys have been doing. And you guys have been supporting him um, pretty big. And he's been tearing up the, the race course this last couple of years. Um, any other little guys you're, you're helping out out there? Uh, just Ruslan, you know, yeah. he came over, approached us, wanted to jump our car, fell in love with it. And so we're like, hey, you're young, you're building a career. We're just out here having fun, trying to get exposure for the business is why we got into racing, you know, and uh, get our name out there. Right. And, you know, we're, you know, our backs can't take it too much more, <laughs> those big air jumps, you know. So when he came over wanting to huck the car, looked at Trevor and we both smiled. We're like, yep, no problem, buddy. And it also just proves the car, right? It just shows the craftsmanship and the, the components and yeah. and what they can take. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, if you throw your machine off of a, a mountainside, it's not going to survive. But yeah. Um, but definitely uh, getting back to Wyatt Hastings real quick. Fast kid, really smart. He's a great racer. Um, he, he doesn't make mistakes, man. That kid, you get behind him on the racetrack, and you ain't getting around him. Plays really good defense. He's fast. And there's, he doesn't give you any openings to pass that guy. If he gets in front of you, you're pretty much taking second or whatever place you're in behind him. You yeah, know? he but goes 110 into the corner. Like oh, he's, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't slow he's down. Good. He's going to go big in the industry for sure. We, and, and he uh, started on the RS1 yeah. and it recently upgraded to the Pro XP. Yeah. Um, and so he's in a full full size car with a full size turbo setup. And oh yeah. So he's got lots of power now. 
Uh, so it'll be interesting. He was at, um, he's been to all the takeovers uh, that I was at, but he's also raced. Uh, he he won the the short course racing in in Utah against Al Macbeth. Yep. So that's saying something. That guy's not slow. No, absolutely not. He's yeah. fearless. Yeah. So I have I've actually got a bunch of footage to put together for a, a vlog on that one. Uh, look forward to that. Um, some good footage from that race. So uh, got got Al and and Wyatt up at ninety degrees up in the air. It's pretty That's fun. That's awesome. Um, so yeah, good guys. And uh, shout out to those guys. They're on Instagram, Facebook, and all that. Uh, and shout out to Wyatt's parents, uh, Doug and um, his wife's name's. I'm spacing it at the moment, but anyways, super supportive parents, super nice parents. You know, absolutely, they're 100 focused on making sure he's safe and by safe driving effectively and and correctly and not making those errors. Right. And yep, absolutely. So, um, yeah, good luck to him next season. He's, yeah, his. Uh, I was just talking to his dad a few days ago, and he was telling me their race season, their schedule, they got set up, and I don't know how they do it. I mean, they're going to be on the road most 24/7. of the year. He's got a lot of a, a few different circuits, and then all the UTV takeovers and. Um, a few other things up his sleeve that he's going to be trying to get Wyatt out and into, but definitely uh, they've got a full schedule, man. It's it takes a huge commitment for a family to be able to have your your kid out there racing and uh, racing that many events, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a dedicated family. The whole family has to be behind it at that point. Absolutely. You know, you look at some of these racers that are up and comers uh, in the in the short course scene. There's a lot of uh, like 15 to 17 year old young people getting into the scene and their families are there at the track, the full trailer, the full, the dogs, the cats, the, the refrigerator, everything's yep. <laughs> there. And, uh, and a lot of those guys are doing schooling, you know, at the track, yep. like making it work. And, uh, obviously this last year has been really weird, but I think that's going to be a huge win for a lot of these young people that want to get into racing where they can say there's now options to do online learning and, and remote learning and things like that. And, um, it's kind of a, a positive side effect of all the negativity from this last year is is i think there's gonna be some more open doors for a lot of these young racers yeah i hope so you know it's good seeing these guys get out and get involved in in the industry or just anything you know it's uh just i feel like just being out and and being a part of this stuff just builds a a good relationship with your family and you know keeps everybody together and from sitting around and playing <laughs> video games all day long you know they're just out being active and right i, I like seeing that so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the backstory on the business. Um, uh, Addiction Power Sports Northwest. Where where did that all start? How did it come to be? How did you guys meet? Like, um, Trevor's always the silent one guy over in the corner, <laughs> like taking care of business. So um, yeah, I'd love to hear both of your guys' kind of backgrounds and where you came from, how the how the company came together. Yeah, um, we live in the same town, so we just met just being locals, um, known each other for I don't know ten twelve years ish now. Um, <laughs> Addiction started at Dune Fest around the campfire. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And when, when was that? That was uh, what 2018. Yep, 2018. Two years ago, or just over two years ago. October was two years. So yeah, we were just <clears throat> we we're side by side enthusiasts ourselves. We've, I mean, we camped together at the Dunes for years, and um, we weren't. We want a little more from what we could get locally from certain shops, so we decided that let's create what we want right and we both spent the first two years non-stop in there just hustling and putting the work in um donate our time for two years and then now we're able to kind of step back a little bit and let it do its thing nice so you guys have a shop down in woodland um how big's your shop down how many do you guys have bays or is it just kind of a big and open area or yeah it's a big shop we've got we've got a big outdoor secured storage covered secured storage uh out back with six bays and then we've got a couple of outdoor bays um, that are secured as well. And then we've got four service bays and then two bays that we've just opened up and that's our showroom for product. Um, so it's a decent sized shop. I don't know where we're at square footage wise, um, offhand, but you got a, a lot of cars spot. coming in and out oh, um, yeah. out of the shop. Yeah, so I know you guys have been posting a lot of pictures about product. And like you were saying, you now have that front entry area to, to have product and, and all that. Um, you know, kind of what do you guys seeing a lot of sales through and, and customer experience, positive feedback. Where where you guys seeing that kind of trending? I know you guys are, are West Coast, so yeah. a lot of our East Coast listeners are gonna be like blah blah blah. But yeah, right. Um, you know, obviously there's gonna be kind of a trend for the Northwest, what people are wanting to buy, what they're putting on their cars. I, I would say that we cater mostly to the Duners, you know, really, because there's uh you know, we get a little bit of trail riding out where we're at, but not a whole lot. A lot of it's uh warehouser land, it's all gated off and they don't want you up there in your side by sides and so you're directed to a few areas, you no know, Browns Camp if you want to go trail riding, and then uh, of course the Dunes are a big a big hit out here. So we we cater mostly, I think, to the Duners in terms of 
aftermarket accessories and parts for those guys. But anybody, anybody that needs anything, we've got it for sure. You know, we we try to carry a little bit of everything for everybody. And um, you know, even with that being said, you know, the East Coast guys as well. Our first year in business, we traveled and traveled and traveled and traveled. Like we just wore out Trevor's truck, I think. But uh, <laughs> anyways, you know, we wanted to get out to the East Coast. We wanted to get down south. We wanted to hit all these different events and see what kind of product are down. You know, there's different product, different manufacturers that are local to those guys that we don't even know about up here that we haven't seen out here, you know. So it's kind of nice to get down there, talk to the people, look at the different product people are using. And in our first year in business, that's what we did because we wanted to make sure that we were, we knew what we were selling. If somebody wanted some product and asked us a question, told us what they were kind of shooting for, that we were giving them good advice and selling them the right part. You know, we don't want to just sell them something because we get good margins. We really want to make sure they're getting the part they need to go do what they want to do. Um, and I think our first year in business, we gained a lot of experience in that. And we raced, you know, that was our first year even racing. We were like, hey, originally we started going to some races. Trevor says, let's go down and check this out. And start talking about our shop and trying to get our name out there. And uh, after watching a few races, we're like, dang, this looks like these guys are having fun. Let's go grab a couple cars and right. start racing, you know, just to help get our name out there. And uh, we traveled with that. And we just, we had a lot of fun with it. We love the business. We love the industry. And, and we've had nothing but fun um, for the first few years. And we're looking forward to a lot more of just good times and meeting cool people and being able to help people out. So you guys have kind of a background just in general, stuff like what were you doing before uh the off-road business we've always been into off-roading i keep looking at trevor because i'm like i don't want to be a guy just talking the whole time <laughs> but i don't want to be stepping on toes but anyways uh we've always been into off-roading whether it's you know we we've, we've always had wheelers trevor's built some big nasty wheelers in his life i mean monster truck looking trucks big blocks on rock wells with 54 inch boggers and full buggy chassis i mean what four wheel steering and He's built some pretty sweet wheelers. So we've always been off-roaders. Um, you know, and then in 2014, they came out with the side by the Razor 1000. Right. The thing that changed the industry. Blew my mind. I was looking at that thing on a on a Players uh, commercial, and it, I was like, man, I need one of those. And I just paid off my snow wheel through Players. <laughs> so I was, called them up, said, hey, let's rack that back up. I need a car. <laughs> and ever since then, I my wheeler has just been parked. I haven't even been wheeling much, you know, since then, but except for with the side-by-sides and it's just amazing how capable they are and, and uh, how well built they are, and they can just take a beating every weekend and just keep on going. So, it's kind of how I got into the side by side thing, you know. And I have been ever since 2014. And then I'm not sure exactly when you got into side by sides or. I bought my first one in 2015. Right after I seen his, I'm like, God damn, I need one of those. <laughs> it always is, is a good uh, buddy that that one steps you, so you can go. <laughs> yeah. you can't have to go catch up with him. Yeah, it was crazy. We used to go to the dunes and be like the only side by sides out there looking around. Like this is crazy. It used now to just be quads. Yeah, now it's the opposite. Like, what's a quad? Right. <clears throat> um, but before that, um, I have a powder cutting shop. Uh, me and my wife run that, and so we were doing a lot of side by side stuff. I was doing some builds out of my garage for people, and I don't know I, I liked it and wanted to do more of it. Right. So, Caitlin, what what have you been? I mean, this is a, kind of a huge transition for someone to jump into this world. Like, how have you seen it change? Kind of just your perspective on on how they do business and stuff. Um it it was a lot of learning because obviously neither of them have had a experience running a store or you know that kind of side of it but because they're so enthusiastic about the sport it makes it so fun and they like getting in there and meeting people and obviously bj likes talking to people <laughs> <laughs> just a little uh, so just a little. i know every time i see him out ripping you're either in the passenger seat or or somewhere in a second car or, or something i mean what was your take on getting into youth fees? I mean, obviously you like them. Like, yeah. what was your transition into that? Uh, well, like anything that we end up with, BJ said, I want to get one of those. And I said, <laughs> we probably shouldn't. And he came home with it. <laughs> and, and then, of course, I wanted to ride in it because we already have the thing. So I got in it and it was really, really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm assuming you went out you know, rock crawling or doing any kind of jeeping or whatever with the guys. How is it different for you as, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you are always the passenger, but as a passenger, how has it been different for you to go from something like a, a bigger truck to a more open cockpit type scenario? Once I realized how capable and 
strong the machine is like after we put obviously right away we put an aftermarket cage on it just because safety right um and when i realized that this thing was going to protect me better than probably even the truck it was it, it was, was a on. go it was a go <laughs> so yeah you get strapped in there and you're basically in this little safety capsule and just tear it up he's a great driver i trust him so that's huge there was a lot of learning there i think we used to flop the car almost every weekend if we <laughs> yeah, didn't flop I mean... the car it was weird like we weren't even trying we weren't even having fun if we didn't wreck the car or roll it or something right. you know on a week on a week every time we went out there it was insane but uh as the cars progressed and got longer travel and started adding the sway bars front and rear you know it really made the car grounded a lot better and uh stick better and and i learned a lot from my mistakes you know back then just playing right. She was actually the first one to flop. Her and one of her girlfriends took off with the razor right after we got it. Come back bombing down the road. They go shooting out into the field, doing a big 360 out there and just hooked up. And I see the headlights go full up and up sideways. <laughs> Ran out there. They were okay. That was the biggest concern, you know. Right. But yeah, that was immediately when I realized, hey, we need to get some safety parts on here. We need four-point harnesses and a cage like right out of the gate. Right. You know? And I think you guys have... Uh local company do your cages for you right fab it up great guy well we run we started with fab it up on our race car um he's got all of our our uh race cage spec built to where we can go race best in the desert any race we want it'll spec out and and uh, we'll be good and and we we feel really safe in there um is that our, a is that a two inch cage yeah it's one and three quarter but it's it looks all, bigger and yeah it's all 120 dom and that's heavy okay. yeah but that's it, super heavy it takes <laughs> A few guys to put it on there. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. it's, it's way overbuilt, which is what we wanted. Right. I know I'm not going to, you know, generally we're not going to crash going slow. You know, we're going to crash at a high speed if we crash. And it's right. we want to make sure whoever's in that car comes out in one piece, you know. So that's why we, we gave up a little bit on the weight to have a better, safer cage um, for that. But uh, our production cages that we sell, we roll with WCI Off-Road. They built a really great cage. They're local, uh, local enough, you know, a little bit down into Oregon, but mm -hmm. real good product. Um, we've never had an issue with their cages, and 095 DOM tubing, they're a great cage, you know. So right. And then you guys, obviously, any color you want, basically. Absolutely. Whichever <laughs> takes care of when that. When you happen to have a powder coating shop around the corner. Yeah, makes the it nice. The car always looks like new, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's an interesting topic that I don't really hear people talking about, Um a lot of guys will have their cages and they'll roll them. They'll they'll slide them on the dirt, whatever. You know, what's the process on getting a car a, a cage repowder coated to a, you know looking new? Is it that, is that a big process or is that kind of like something that anyone can just pop some money down and get it done? Yeah, it's it is a lot of work, but it is something you can just do every time if you want. Luckily for us, it's a little more feasible. But um, you sandblast off the old powder and you prep the cage and repowder coat it, and it's. So do you just do the localized blasting, or do you do the whole cage? Um, the whole cage. Usually. Probably prefer to do it that way. Yeah, just if not, you'll get it won't be smooth and clean looking. You'll get some highs and lows, and so right. Especially on a used cage, even after it's blasted, usually you got to do a little blending with sanding and stuff like that to make sure it comes out mm -hmm. looking great. So one thing that I noticed, um, there was a couple guys uh, this last year that I that had gotten cages and they had gotten like a textured finish on their powder coating. Um, I have traditionally been more of a smooth finish type guy um are there any kind of different grades of powder coating or things that if people's buying a cage that they're looking into powder coating to match their other rest of the car like some things that they can take away as far as just things to look out for or ask for um it's all going to be a good finish no matter what um, a lot of the fancier colors go into a two or even a three stage powder um, the textures are nice because you don't really see a scratch on texture unless you really get aggressive so it depends if somebody brings me something that has like some metal pitting or something like that, we'll recommend a texture or if it's got some dings and a pretty beat up cage, we'll recommend texture just to make everything look smooth. Helps hide some of those, those battle wounds. <clears throat> yeah. But in terms of durability, they're both neck and neck. So, um, you were talking about the safety part of the cage and all that. And I know you guys, um, you have one or two daughters. We have one, one daughter. daughter, one daughter. And I know that she's been out ripping in the cars. <laughs> Um, you know, how does that, how does you, how do you approach that as a parent and, and thinking about their safety and, and their education on driving and all that? As opposed to not letting them do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, one thing I, we, yeah. we always trust our kids, you know, and we tell them it, when we, when we first got into the side by sides, you know, obviously you get a bunch of money wrapped up into these things and, right. uh, my kids could take it out and go ride it around, you know, as long as they stayed where I could see them. 
So that way, if something happened, I could get out there quick and I knew it happened, but uh, it was before we had communication system in it. But there you have one rule. You flop the car, you wreck the car, you don't get to ride it no more because <laughs> it's mine. Right. They all had quads, you know? And so we have four kids, three boys, one girl, and uh, it got to the point where none of them could take the car out no more. They'd all rolled it. <laughs> so, and it didn't uh, dig long at all. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. They, They're all fearless. We took our kids to the dunes from the time they were on little LT-80s, and we were camping in our truck at Sand Lake uh, for the weekend. So they've grown up in the dunes. and they So they, they understand safety. respecting the dunes and, Absolutely. They, and all that, that that comes along with riding that kind of train. Yes. yes. Don't Absolutely. trust anything you can't see. Our right. daughter rips hard. Like, I'm not just being that parent. Our daughter <laughs> is aggressive. Well, when we went out to Coos and we went on that little oh, dune yeah. session, like, I thought you were driving the one car, and I'm up there, and I'm, like, going to go talk to you, and then I'm like, you're not Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, that's our daughter. So that's rad. There's a, uh, there's a lot of people that... Um, that do let their kids go explore their cars and whatever, but they don't really take into consideration the changes to the car that require for safety and, and things like that. And obviously a cage is a huge part of that, but also yeah. adjusting your harnesses to the correct size, making Absolutely. sure they're locked in correctly. Not, you know, some of us biggest, bigger guys in the driver's seat, when someone smaller gets into the driver's seat, the harness connects up at the like rib cage, right? Like yep. it has to get adjusted down to the proper setting. And, and they really need to understand that and, and be able to do that. Yeah. yeah, our kids are also huge on safety. We've just drilled it into their heads. Helmets are number one. Obviously, you do not get on your quad even just to go down the hill for a minute without a helmet. And My biggest thing has just been getting kids to strap it, yeah. strap the helmet shut. Like if it doesn't stay on, it's no use. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah, definitely the seat belts being adjusted properly is huge. You know what I mean? If you're if you're curious how to how to set it up you always want to cinch your waistline first get it right down along the belt line cinch it down nice and tight and then snug up your shoulder harnesses and that keeps you kind of right where you need to be but uh you know and if you've got the kind that clip right in the middle you want to get it down onto your chest and not have it up into your throat or down too low you know you want to be right up in your chest area right with your center clip so um you know as far as the shop goes um what are the maybe the top three things that you guys constantly are working through with customers on education or um possibly you know the product misunderstandings things like that what are kind of some of the things you guys deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with um the customers so obviously it all changes everything every day is a new day yep. but <clears throat> that's my favorite part about it i like somebody coming in and having a question and wondering how something works and I'll sit there and chat all day and go through every detail of every different part and how it works and why and how it benefit you. And um, I don't push products on people. I let them choose what they kind of like and educate them on the products. And so anywhere from a, you know, two people take the same rig, go down the same trail, but they drive different. So there's going to be different tires that fit you better than you, no matter what. <clears throat> um, on our first year, we took every different set of paddle tires we could buy and took turns taking a weekend trip with each one, just riding it, seeing how they slide, seeing how they hook. Um, that's how we ended up with the tires we used to race with in the sand. They're one of the cheapest tires you can get, but they got just enough slide to where they work right. So we want to be able to know that when you ask me about a product, I know exactly how it works and how, like, I know you're going to like it. So That's a big thing. A lot of shops that are um, maybe franchises or, you know, have high turnaround on employees, things like that, that are more of a dealership scenario. Um they don't really have the experience with the product to really recommend something for a situation, right? They just, they have products and it's up to you what your yeah. price point is and then they'll sell you that thing, right? Absolutely. And so it's really important for you to, as a consumer, um, to know you're working with a quality shop that understands the product, that understands the differences, that there's a reason between a tread pattern change, there's a reason between a paddle count, there's a reason between width changes, there's, you know, all that stuff. You know, what does a wall fitness on a cage actually turn into safety-wise? Um, otherwise, you know, you're just getting sold something. So working with a local shop, that's why it's awesome to have shops like you guys and, and other, uh, great quality shops around the country, um, with people that actually go and wreck their cars and know why they wrecked them and, and what parts worked and what parts don't and have put the time in and the money in to figure that all out. Makes a big difference, you know, cause realistically I've done it before in the past. I'm like, all right, this looks good. I want to build that. And I start throwing it together and realize that wasn't what I wanted. It's not. I'm breaking it every weekend or something. I got to go back and spend more money to redo it. You know, and it's better if you can grab somebody else's knowledge that's already been there, done that, broke this and that, and then 
steer you in the right direction to where you don't have to go through all those casualties or money spent, you know, to get where you actually want to be. Right. So um, you talked a little bit about going to King & Hammers. Have you been there before? Uh, we, raced, we raced there last year, Trevor. Okay, and so I that's did. what I thought. I thought you guys went last year. So how was that experience? Mind-blowing. It was insane. <laughs> it, it's one of the most... Uh, the biggest endurance race we've ever been in. I mean, there was times where we were yelling at each other, let me out of the car. You ain't, no, we ain't stopping. You know I mean? It was, it was pretty, it, it starts beating on you after a while. You know, it really does. It gets in your head and uh, it, it taught us a lot. Um, I think it might've, might even brought us closer. I don't know. Or pushed us further apart. I, don't know. <laughs> I think it made us better friends. You know, we got done. I think we didn't even talk to each other after the race for 20 minutes. And then we went over, I think we hugged it out and, you know, it gets really intense, you know, especially right. when your, your car's starting to break and we're trying to finesse it through. And, and I'm really good at getting excited and, uh, making errors, you know? And so Trevor's <laughs> like, slow this car down. You're going to break it. No, we're not. I got it. And it, no, we broke it, you know? So. So which car did you run? The same car. Oh, really? The same turbo? 2019 Turbo S. Wow. That thing's been all over. Short course. We just alter it to whatever we're going to go race and or huck it. We just change up the suspension. Um, So then you ran the did you did was it stock turbo then or did you run modified? We had our modified turbo on there as well that year. Yeah, we ran pump gas, not E85, but same turbo. Gotcha. So, um, kind of what was your expectation going in it before the race, before you knew everything that was going to transpire, like kind of how was your mindset going into that race? Cause that's not a small race just to go try. No, no it's a big <laughs> one. Yeah. That's why, you know, we learned a lot in that race. Um, slow and steady wins the race. That was, uh, that's key to that one. You know, just don't abuse and break the car, try to keep it in one piece. You know, the less, the less breakage, the, the faster you get through the course, but um, shoot what we expect. I didn't even know what to expect coming to that race. I just knew it was going to be a long race. And I mean, right down to, you got to think about, you ain't stopping for bathroom breaks. Nope. You keep on going. So that was some things that we didn't realize we were getting into. You know? so we're like, okay. <laughs> so you guys didn't have the catheters or anything? <laughs> oh, we had, no, we had all that. Oh, okay. <laughs> coming into it, heading down there, you know, right. uh, rugged radios takes really good care of us. And, uh, they had everything when we got there. They're like, you guys got these? No. I said, <laughs> We got them for you. What do you think yeah. you're going to stop and go pee? You know, like uh, we didn't think about it, you know? Right. And so we, we learned a lot of like, they're just things that we didn't even think about. Logistics the logistics sides of racing, yeah. right? And, uh, and it was awkward, but we had a really good time. <laughs> um, you know, cause we'd heard horror stories of those things just not working right. Yeah. And you get out of the car all wet at the end of the race, you know? Right. So. Yeah. There's a bunch of racers this last season that were talking about who got to, who got the short of the stick to wash the car. Oh, and... yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's weird when your buddy looks at you, all right, small, medium, or large. <laughs> I don't one know. One of those large. situations give me, give where you don't want to lie about your size. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Cram, get the smallest uh, one on there possible. You don't want it popping off. The um, So going into the race, I mean, Last year's race was was pretty good. Uh, I know that this year uh, we're we're prepping for that. Is that next week that they're running? Two weeks. Uh, two weeks. It's the end of the month, right? It's coming up. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know that they've kind of reversed a lot of the course uh, obstacles, and so you'll be going up a lot this year uh, versus down a lot like last year. Um, and I know that they have a new trail that they're going to be um, claiming as their new trail this year. So that's a big thing. And I know that it took them all day to get through it. So. Um, you know, it's going to be a pretty epic race this year, I think. Yeah. Um, but going through the race, you know, obviously, did you guys have a chance to go pre-run anything in, or? A little bit, you know, and we learned a lot in the pre-run. You know, we thought, okay, going back to our rock crawling, playing in the in the woods and, and stuff with our trucks days, you know, you want to air your pressure down a little bit. You know, so we thought, well, we don't want to be too low, obviously. So we started around 15 and we instantly first. <laughs> Dropped five more. <laughs> well, no, we popped two tires right out of the gate. Oh, wow. We started talking to people and they're like, no, you got to, the big guys are running like 40 PSI and they're really, tires. they're going that stiff. The big ultra four guys are running big pressure. Wow. So we jumped, started talking to some of the UTV guys and we got it up to 20 and that worked out really good. But you just, you wouldn't think about that going into a rock race, you know, but you'd want to pinch a bead, you know, and then right. have to be changing tires. So we, yeah, I guess it'd be really easy to shred a tire, you know, collapsing in the sidewall on a, on an obstacle. So that makes yeah. sense. So we ended up, I mean, that was something we didn't think about either, but we learned it real fast the first day of pre-run, and we popped two tires in a matter of two miles. Luckily, um, we had sit on a race line hooking us up. They had a support truck there, so they encouraged us, go, go, try them. If it don't work, come back. We'll keep putting new tires on there. Just make sure to get it done. That's rad. So, 
so uh, uh, did you guys, were you able to finish the race last year? We made it to, I think, like mile 137 out You're of over one, here 60 something. <laughs> Trying to look around this gear so I can give her the eye. I'm hiding. What are you laughing about? <laughs> Yeah, we made it to uh, mile one thirty something. We were limping on a broken axle. We were just about to our pit. We had our we had our whole crew there. We had a great pit staff. Uh, we teamed up with Hellbent side by side. Those guys are amazing, super organized. Um, it was both they of our last year too, right? Yep, yeah, it was both of our first year trying King of the Hammers. Um, those guys finished out, did really well. We made it to mile one thirty seven. We were limping on a broken front axle, and we were coming down a rock canyon. And there's cars bumping into us, running the siren, wanting us to get out of the way with there's nowhere to go. We're coming through a canyon, you know. So I'm carrying a little more momentum than I should have with a broken front. And I was just trying to pick good soft lines. And uh, the one tire with the broken axle hung up behind a rock, kicked us straight sideways, and we're just sitting there teetering, blocking the trail. I said, well, hold on, Trevor. We got one option. That's to steer into this and just punch it and hope punch it'll it. jump down and get us straightened out. And it didn't. It just flopped us on the lid, which – not a big deal. Um, people started going around us. We jump out. Oil's pouring everywhere. I've oh, no. I've wrecked a lot of razors. I've never had oil just come pouring out of the air filter. And uh, it was just a, a worst case scenario of how everything lined up when the car flopped and oil started pouring out of it. And uh, by the time we got the winch out and winched it back over onto the tires, they don't hold much oil. And we had a lot of oil yeah. on the ground. So we were nervous and nothing on the dipstick. Yeah. At that point, we knew we were going to win the race. Um, so there was no, there was no point in just destroying the motor to try to get that last 30 miles or whatever we had left to go. Right. This wasn't like a factory sponsored car that we were throwing away at the end of the race. So. No. So, uh, <laughs> we, we just sat it out and called our pit crews and they were bringing us oil. And after about an hour of sitting there, we got a little on the dipstick, you know, after everything settled. So we were able to poke it down out of the Canyon that we were in and, and get back out there. And by then. She'd showed up in one of our chase razors, and a few of our other buddies were with her. So, got the car back to camp. But we made one thirty something out of I think I think it was one hundred sixty some miles or something last year. We were close. Yeah. Well, it's pretty rare that somebody finishes hammers on the first try. So. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of learning that on that race that you don't get, just like the car and, and some of the Baja Thousand and all these car races that people just don't finish the first time usually. Yeah. So, I mean, shout out to the Hellbent boys for finishing. Absolutely. That was a big achievement we for were, them. We were stoked for those guys. Yeah. Good group of guys. So, uh, what are you guys looking for, forward to in 21? This is a kind of a pivotal point that everyone's kind of looking back on this last crazy year and, and what 21's going to bring opportunity-wise for everybody. Um, what are you guys looking forward to? Nice thing is our car's not broken after a race, which is really weird. So, <laughs> normally, our goal is to try to get it ready so we can go do something. Right. <laughs> but that's in good shape um our new website is getting ready to launch anytime and it's we got a lot of time money in it and it's freaking awesome our web guy that's building it's doing a fantastic job so we're super excited for that hopefully we can pick up some internet sales and focus on shipping and stuff like that yeah it'll be uh that'll be a big change for us because right now we kind of direct everybody to call the shop because the website that we originally had built you know we didn't we didn't really know what we were getting into we just started talking to people and this guy had some great advice that he could do this for us, and he built us a nice website. It just wasn't really what we were looking for. So we we realized quickly it, it needed to change, and we needed a new platform and everything else. So right now we're, we try to direct everybody to call the shop. You know, we'll take care of you. We'll drop ship to your door, whatever we got to do. But uh, our new website should be sweet. It's going to work nice. It'll be efficient. It'll be easy to surf through and um, and hopefully easy to check out as well, you know, and not and – not, get to where you really have to work to buy something on our website. And that's kind of right. how I feel with the one we currently have. So the new one should be awesome. And we look forward to uh, potentially having to set up a shipping department of yeah. the business this year. So That's been, you know, every, every – Ian and I have talked about this on the last few podcasts that, you know, 2020 was really the year that separated those that understood adapting to the online market and how that works with off-road parts. Like there's a, there's a certain amount of customer education. There's a certain amount of like advertising that you have to work through that people don't like doing because it's cost money. Like there's a whole bunch of that stuff that you have to be flexible with that people either, either you did it and you won or you didn't and you suffered. And, uh, some people were able to suffer, suffer more than others, you know, that kind of storyline. But, um, but yeah, the, the online, the online market is, is obviously going to be a big game changer for a lot of, uh, mom and pop shops. And then just over overall in the off-road industry, they're kind of slow to take up a lot of this stuff. So we're starting to see more and more brands adopt this online philosophy. And, um, it's going to require some education, some, some, 
video and things like that that customers need to see and, and understand what they're talking to. Um, but uh, any events you guys are going to uh, excited to get to this year? That's another thing we're we're hoping for. You know, it's hard to say right now because we don't know kind of where we're going, even with our presidential stuff that's going on right now. Right. So uh, it depends on how bad COVID is again in 2021. You know, 2020 shut down most of our racing. So we are looking forward to hopefully having some races open back up and getting back out on the track and just having fun with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, hopefully going to be, you know, m everybody's excited to get out and do more this year. So hopefully with the vaccine and, and some of the other things that are happening, maybe we can uh, get lucky this year and, and get out more. So uh, yeah, hopefully they don't shut our dunes down again. Frickin' A, that was horrible. That was terrible. <laughs> Cried a little. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyways, uh, you guys at, uh, it's uh, addiction power, uh, is it dash power sports .com? Uh, Just www addiction dot addiction power sports nw for northwest dot com. And then Instagram, uh, find you guys there, Facebook. Yeah. Facebook, Instagram, and and uh, our website here soon. Check it out. But uh, we'll be moving into, we're going to start, hopefully have some time to start moving into trying to get our YouTube. We have a YouTube set up, but we don't have nothing on there yet. We're going right. to start trying to push that as well. Like Trevor said, we went pretty hard ourselves and all of our time invested every day, all day long almost, you know, for uh, the first two years to get addiction up off the ground. And now we've got good management, good employees, uh, a, great, a great service team, and mm -hmm. We're able to step back a little bit now to where we can start focusing on other things like the website, which we're about done with, and then we'll be able to move into the YouTube, try to get some – we we get a lot of footage that we just never use. You know, right, We take right. a lot of videos and the time to – as you know, the time to edit it and actually get it up and make it look good. It's a full-time job. Yeah. So hopefully we can get some of that going this year as well. Awesome. Well, uh, look forward to the new website. Look forward to seeing you guys out on the on the trails and the dunes and stuff this year. Maybe we can get out and do some more filming. I love um, it. Everybody was pretty receptive to that edit we did this uh, this last uh, winter. So, um, yeah, look forward to uh, 21 and seeing what you guys do and how you grow and, and what you can break and rebuild yeah. and um, <laughs> all of that. So, uh, yeah, it's been fun to have you guys. You guys were just swinging by uh, through our area on the way back from uh, the Insanity Fab race. So, uh, caught you just in the nick of time. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, so it was, uh, we've been wanting to do this for a while, and um, yeah, it's been a good time. So thanks for stopping by, guys. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, everybody online, check them out at Addiction uh, Power Sports Northwest. And then uh, if you're listening to uh, this on iTunes, uh, feel free to live, give us a like and a, and a review. Uh, we're also available on Google and Spotify and all those other places. Uh, YouTube, you can, if you want to watch the video, um, and uh, anywhere else online you can think of, we're there. So uh, go subscribe, go like, follow these guys. They have a great um, Instagram and, and other things that they do throughout the year. So uh, follow them. And uh, until the next time, guys, peace. Oh,